the Golden State, water has always been the greatest treasure, the resource most worth fighting over and controlling. In the early decades of the 20th century, transfers of water for development in Southern California turned Owens Lake to a dry lake bed, a tale of greed fictionalized in the movie Chinatown. In the 1980s, toxic discharges from corporate agriculture on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley led to the deformity or death of thousands of birds, forcing closure of the Kesterson National Wildlife Refuge. The powerful water interest that turned Owens Lake into a dry lake bed and caused the disaster at Kesterson still control California's water resources and the message about the state's water. They are trying to shore up an outdated water system with a massive multi-billion dollar water transfer project that Californians will be paying for for decades. They are in the process of destroying the Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta and estuary and the fisheries that depend on it. This is a story of what they are doing, what they hope to achieve, and what the people of the Delta stand to lose. When you have heard this story, you will understand why they must be stopped for the sake of the Delta and all the people of California. My name is Rajin Reynolds. I grew up on Roberts Island. I'm from a farming family that's been here since the 1880s. My dad was a farmer and I've been here all my life. We're a different kind of farming on Roberts Island. If you flew over, you'd see what looks like a beautiful quilt of farms. And what we have here is what's called diversified farming. This is habitat for people, and we're wildlife friendly farming. For the first time in my life, I feel like the state is an enemy. I told my husband I'm turning into an anarchist. I'm Bobby Barrick fishing guide, tournament fisherman, seminar speaker, out here trying to represent the California Delta because it doesn't have a voice. We're the only voice that it has. Uh, the Delta was world renowned as a bass fishery, as a trophy bass fishery, as a place to go where you can catch a lot of bass, but that has changed a lot. And it's in direct correlation with the diminishing water quality that we've had through that period of time. If the water contractors and all those guys get their way, my days of guiding are pretty much over out here. California's two largest rivers, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin, come together east of the San Francisco Bay to form an inverted delta that covers parts of five counties. They're fed by tributaries that carry Sierra snowpack and winter rains from 40% of the state's land. Before Europeans came to California, the delta was a region that flooded almost annually in a shifting landscape that provided a home for scores of species of fish, land animals, and birds. In the middle of the 19th century, Native American lands were taken, and the federal government encouraged the draining of swamp lands throughout the nation. Newcomers to California began to build levees and turn delta soils into prime farmland, the best place to grow crops. Although humans changed the landscape, fisheries and farms thrived together in the delta for over 100 years. In the 20th century, people began looking for ways to move water to drier parts of the state, irrigating places that were once too dry for crops or cities or had less than ideal soils for farming. The irrigated lands and the thirsty cities grew. Ambitious plans to store and move water grew with that thirst. The federal government built the Central Valley Project, the CVP. The state of California built the State Water Project, the SWP. When the federal government built Friant Dam east of Fresno, San Joaquin River flows into the Delta were reduced. Then the federal government built Shasta Dam and the state built Oroville Dam to store water from northern rivers and control their flow. They installed giant electric pumps at the south end of the Delta to move water down the California aqueduct 
and the Delta Mendota Canal to agriculture in the southern Central Valley and to South Coast and Southern California cities. All this engineering had a major impact on the way the Delta functioned, both for people and for fish. People in the Delta, like John Herrick, General Counsel for the South Delta Water Agency, have been fighting an unequal battle for their region ever since. And so it was appropriate years ago for the state legislature to say, well, let's figure out how we could adjust this mismatch between where people are or needs are and where all the water's flowing. And it was a good idea to say, okay, we build dams, we transport water here and there because that, that's a net benefit. They didn't have any idea about adverse impacts to fisheries when they conceived this stuff. The water projects that reduced the amount of water flowing through the Delta also changed its quality. Engineer and farmer Alex Hildebrand and his daughter Mary have been farming in the South Delta for decades. If you go back to the 1940s, before the project started, uh, we had a vibrant fishery and uh, we didn't have any salinity problem whatsoever. And uh, We had good deep channels. Yeah, we had good deep channels, <clears throat> but now the channels have aggraded. The salinity's gone way up beyond anything we had before. And the inflow to the delta has been largely eliminated. And that's the basic problem. This wasn't supposed to happen. Water needs in the area of origin, the places the water comes from, were supposed to be protected. Only surplus water was supposed to be available for export. And when they did this, they had smart people back then who sat around and said, well, if we're gonna make these radical changes, there has to be some, there have to be some promises made. We have to make sure that where we're taking it doesn't get shorted. You know, if it comes down to price, Los Angeles can buy all the water in the state. We can't bid on that. We could never win. So they made these promises, and the promises are the areas of origin will be maintained and have a future supply if they want it. What we have in California are very strong laws. Uh, which uh, protect our water supply. Unfortunately, uh, our agencies that are charged with implementing and enforcing those laws are very weak and have become weaker over time. We didn't know that we couldn't trust the government. We certainly know it now. Yeah. Another person who has been following California water issues for decades is journalist Lloyd Carter. But one of the uh, fundamental problems is that the Water Board has issued permits for 8.4 times as much water as actually exists in the system in an average year. And they've, they've given out permits for three times as much water as we've had in the biggest year on record. The system only produces so much water. The areas where the water comes from have a certain level of demand. What's left over to export to dry areas of the state? Well, in the worst drought that we've had, if it repeated, if it repeated, there's nothing for exports. Not some, not a little, there's nothing. Water taken from the Delta is measured in acre feet. An acre foot of water is the amount it would take to fill a football field with water one foot deep. The exporters want 6.2, 6.5 million acre feet a year. It's not that there are regulatory hurdles to them getting six million acre feet a year. It's not there, it's not anywhere. And that's the dilemma we face. For decades, water planners have dreamed big about shifting water from the northern part of California to the south. The state water project that voters approved in 1960 depended on moving water through existing delta channels, preserving a common pool of quality water for both local and export use but water contractors knew they couldn't get all the water they wanted that way. In 1980, the California legislature passed SB 200 to fund and build a peripheral canal. This canal would carry Sacramento River water directly from where it enters the Delta on the north end to the state and federal project pumping stations at the south end. We launched a campaign to collect signatures to convince Governor Jerry Brown not to sign SB 200. We took the petitions to Sacramento, and he wouldn't meet with us. So the next step was collecting signatures to qualify for a referendum of SB 200. 
There we were successful, and Proposition 9 on the June ballot in 1982 passed, and SB 200 was repealed. That should have been the end of the peripheral canal, but it wasn't. Meanwhile, other things were happening with water supply. North State rivers were given wild and scenic river status, and their waters became permanently unavailable for use by the water projects. This was the water that planners at the Department of Water Resources thought would flow through the peripheral canal. But this reduction in projected supply didn't stop the planning. The State Water Board, which is supposed to allocate water and protect water quality, allowed increasing levels of exports and didn't enforce water quality standards for the Delta. The food chain for fish in the Delta began to deteriorate as the water quality got worse. What is the problem? Water diversion, period. When it became clear that environmental restrictions would limit the amount of water that the water contractors could pump out of the Delta, the exporters and the state and federal agencies got together to put together a habitat conservation plan. The habitat conservation plan would provide just enough protection for the environment that the exporters could continue to pump water from the South Delta. If they can get approval for this plan, called the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, or BDCP, they can get a 50-year take permit under the Endangered Species Act. That's basically a permit to kill a certain percentage of fish in the course of operating the projects. I call it a big, dumb canal plan. The peripheral canal idea was back, although it has a different name now. When the facility they had in mind looked too outrageous about the size of the Panama Canal, they started thinking about a tunnel, like the channel that carries trains between England and France. Water contractors want to build a facility that will take 15,000 cubic feet of water per second through massive pumps in the North Delta and deliver it straight to the project pumps, diverting as little as they can for fish and habitat and less for Delta agriculture. This facility will cost someone a lot of money, upwards of $12 billion just to build it, never mind operating and maintaining it later and making up for the environmental damage it will inevitably cause. If you're a Californian, one way or another, through taxes or higher water rates, you'll end up paying for this. I've been working on these water issues for 41 years. And so I've been through it, I've negotiated with these people. It's sad, but there's no deal to be made, there's no honor. They want to be able to muscle when the time comes. The key to that is that connection between the Sacramento River, where most of the water is, and the pumps. Water is not simply about uh, policy. It's also about politics, and it's about power in California. In 2009, at the height of the drought, People all over the country heard stories about how a bunch of environmentalists in California were so concerned about protecting a little two-inch fish that they didn't care if people dependent on water for farming lost their jobs. We were all told that it was a matter of fish versus jobs. You know, I'm a food producer, and the common denominator between a salmon troller and a farmer is water. What people didn't realize was that this large agribusiness media attack on fish was part of a campaign to convince the public to support the peripheral canal, now part of the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. So let's talk about the fish first. Bill Jennings, executive director of the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance, has spent many years fighting for decent water quality for fish and habitat which is also decent water for people and farming. You look at this, this, this estuary and it, you know, on the surface, it, uh, it looks fine. You've got water, uh, you don't see pollution. This really is one of the great natural estuaries uh, uh, in the world. Um, it's certainly the largest estuary on the west coast of the West Hemis Hemisphere. It's certainly um, uh, the uh, crossroads of, uh, of uh, Samanid migration uh, up to the great rivers of, of, uh, of the Central Valley. 
King salmon are part of California's natural and cultural heritage. Understanding the flow of water needed for salmonic migration, for salmon to move upstream to spawn, is central to the culture of Northern California's Winneman Wintu people, a tribe displaced by the construction of Shasta Dam for the Federal Central Valley Project. Well, when, when we were kids, they just built the Shasta Dam uh, 10 years before I was born. And since we couldn't fish on the McLeod River anymore, we'd go down to the Sacramento River and snag salmon, you know, catch them like we caught them before. And the salmon were, there were way more salmon than there is today. It was not uncommon to catch 60 to 80 pound salmon coming up stream. But can you imagine that those kind of fish would be the ones who keep the riverbeds clean? that help all other animals and the environment, the soils, the plants, the trees, in the upper waters. People are so detached from what fish really do for the water that we drink. And, and you know, we're not talking about a delta smelt or, or, or a salmon. I mean, we're talking about the hemorrhaging of a, of a biological tapestry of an entire ecosystem, multiple species. In 2009 and 2010, the salmon runs were so reduced that for the first time in history, fisheries managers canceled the salmon fishing season for both recreational and commercial fishermen. Did rain in 2011 help? Things aren't back to normal for us, even though we were able to fish last year. It's, it was all because we had a lot of rain last year. And it shouldn't depend on how much rain we get. It should depend on an equitable division of water between agriculture and the fish. A healthy delta is probably the most important thing in my life. Former state senator Mike Machado, now director of the Delta Protection Commission, understands how habitat, agriculture, and commerce in the delta interrelate. Reality, the economy of the delta is actually multiple economies. You not only support the agriculture in the delta, but you do also support the shipping through the deep water channels into Sacramento and into Stockton. You support a vibrant sports fishing industry, a commercial fishing industry, and you also support a food chain that extends onto ocean-specific species. And the cost to us, if we lose those species, in addition to the ones that are here, we haven't yet determined. But the bottom line is, what's at stake is, once something is extinct, it's forever and we shouldn't be restoring yesterday's status quo at the expense of tomorrow's environment. Tom Birmingham, general manager of the huge Westlands Water District, which relies heavily on federal project water, argues that water exports are not the biggest stressor on Delta habitat. I, I can't argue with uh, the, the fact that the operation of the projects have had an effect on the abundance of salmon in the Sacramento River and in, in the San Joaquin River. But I'm not sure that, that, that those effects have led to the decline of the commercial or sports fishing fishery. Many factors are contributing to the loss of habitat for fish and to the decline of water quality in the Delta. Invasive aquatic species, such as Brazilian waterweed and Asian clams have been introduced by humans or have hitchhiked into the Delta on cargo ships that use the region's two international shipping lanes. They've established themselves to compete with native species. But water exports make the problem of invasive species worse. Cities and towns in the region have not always treated their sewage as thoroughly as they should. Runoff from upstream farmland and from cities picks up pesticides and fertilizers that reduce delta water quality. But water exports make the problem of water pollution worse. And there are those, like the exporter-driven Coalition for Sustainable Delta, who insist that striped bass, a sport fish introduced into the Delta in the 19th century, is a major predator on native fish. Dr. Peter Moyle, a fish biologist at the University of California at Davis, disagrees. And the answer that do strike to the question, do striped bass populations have a major impact on Delta smelt populations is no. Um, now, now if, if striped bass are the dominant predator, or historically were the dominant predator in the estuary, uh, as a, and, but they feed today primarily 
on another non-native species, threadfin shad, uh, and they also feed very heavily on their own young. But I guarantee you that if you, could, if you eliminated striped bass from the system completely, you would not see any difference in the populations of delta smelt and probably not a salmon either. This guy has been with salmon in the state of California for over 130 years. They've lived together, they've thrived together in humongous numbers. I'm gonna put this guy back. Although there are a lot of stressors on fish, whether it's bad water quality, whether it's fishermen, you know, whether it's warm temperatures in the water, all sorts of things can affect fish. But all of those things are only important nowadays because the export projects have fundamentally altered the hyd hydronamics in the Delta. They're, they don't want to face the fact that fish need fresh water flowing through the estuary, period. The numbers of fish, the numbers of largemouth that we catch are way, way down. The numbers of stripers that we catch are extremely down. Uh, the system, the system's in trouble. See, I don't care so much about what this environmental group or that fishing group says. Uh, I just would like them to understand the human consequences of the things they advocate. Often, that's not in anybody's mind. The Endangered Species Act regulators and the federal agencies, they don't seem to care about putting people out of work. California's southern central valley has been compared to Appalachia in terms of the level of want suffered by its people. Here, side by side, with some of the most productive farmland in the world, is some of America's greatest poverty. Dr. Jeffrey Michael, director of the Business Forecasting Center at University of the Pacific's Eberhardt School of Business, closely follows the Central Valley's economy. In 2009, he analyzed claims about the connection between reduced water deliveries and job losses. Some of the uh, some of the communities on the west side within the Westlands Irrigation District that are the focus of so much of the media coverage about unemployment, it is true. You know, we are, these are communities that have 30% uh, unemployment. I actually think it may be 40% unemployment now. If you go back to the 1960s, before the Central Valley Project uh, brought irrigation water to the area, these communities had single digit unemployment and were sort of ordinary uh, farming communities. And, uh, you know, this uh, massive increase in irrigation water really intensified the agriculture, the labor requirements of the agriculture, Farm workers moved in with uh, very low wages and seasonal wages. These are communities that had the highest unemployment in the country uh, and the greatest poverty in California long before uh, when water was flowing just fine. Jobs have been lost in the Southern Central Valley in recent years, but unemployment statistics from the last decade show that job losses were related not to reductions in water deliveries, but to the housing collapse, the foreclosure crisis, and the recession they caused. Low-skilled workers were hit especially hard. Well, unemployment in the southern San Joaquin Valley is very high. I mean, currently it's 15% in, in Fresno County. It's historically been very high. So the unemployment increases have been uh, similar to what has been seen in areas north of the Delta. Meanwhile, the importance of economic well-being in the Delta has been ignored. Findings from the Delta Protection Commission's Economic Sustainability Plan show that Delta agriculture is worth over $5 billion annually to the state's economy, and that Delta recreation and tourism, including fishing, is worth over $650 million. Recently, because of the water quality problems in the Delta, uh, I believe that fishery interests and local agricultural interests are aligned very, very closely. The four million people in the Delta region who are tied to these local economies depend on the same water quality that smelt and other fish require. The State Water Project supplies some of the water used by cities in parts of the San Francisco Bay Area and in coastal areas south of San Luis Obispo. But the biggest user is Southern California's Metropolitan Water District. California is at 38 million and we serve drinking water to 19 million people. Metropolitan gets water from the Colorado River and Northern California through the State Water Project. We provide about 50 to 60 percent, depending on the kind of year, of the drinking water used in Southern California. The other 40, 45 percent is locally produced water that comes off our mountains and uh, percolates into our groundwater basins and is pumped up and used locally. Connor Everts, executive director of the Los Angeles-based California Watershed Alliance, 
tracks water use in Southern California and the effectiveness of conservation programs by area water agencies. So water demand across the state of California has gone down about 20%. Since 1978, with over, over a million more people in the LA region, our water demand went down that 20%, and then again another 21% since the large push for the drought and the water bond and, and the economy dropping and then going from dry to wet as we often do. So uh, with demand continuing to lower, water agencies are forced to raise rates, which will cause people to use even less again. There's 20 some uh, state water contractors on the state water project. Metropolitan's the largest. We're entitled to receive up to 50% of the water from the project. The second largest is the a large agricultural contractor, the Kern County Water Agency. They receive a quarter of the state water project. So about half of what MET gets on an average annual basis uh, is uh, what Kern County receives. Kern County is one of the two largest agricultural uses of water exported from the Delta. In recent years, much of that water has gone to permanent crops like pistachios, pomegranates, and almonds. A lot of people in the northern part of the state think it's a bad idea to grow permanent crops in an area that relies so much on irrigation and is so vulnerable to drought. In Kern County, uh, their rainfall is, is only six to nine inches each year. So in order to raise that same crop in Kern County, you have to apply about four acre feet, where we only have to apply about two acre feet in Butte County of, of supplemental irrigation. You have to make a very large area up here dry to make a small area in, in say, Kern County green. The other large agricultural user of Delta water is the Westlands Water District on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. The valley's west side is where the tragedy at the Kesterson Wildlife Refuge occurred. Westlands gets federal project water, and they want a lot of water to irrigate the arid west side. When they don't get that water, they blame government regulations. The district is, uh, is well, it's six, about 600,000 acres, uh, it is, which is about the size of Rhode Island. It's certainly a, a large water district, but uh, today we're looking at significant shortages, and that's what we're, we're struggling mightily with. We've had shortages for the last 20 years. Westlands is somewhat unique in that they have a severe drainage problem because the district is, uh, underneath the district, there are subterranean clay layers that block the downward percolation of applied irrigation water. And this water gets progressively saltier as the years go by and it backs up into the root zone and you can't grow crops, obviously, in waterlogged land or salty groundwater. So for 50 years, they've been searching for a solution. Farmers have planted permanent crops down in the Westlands area and in the valley that were based on surplus water. They knew they were only gonna get water in the wetter years. I think the plans for retirement of land make sense, particularly in those areas that are, that are contributing adversely to the drainage in the San Joaquin River, the high selenium areas, the high boron areas, the areas that can't be sustained without a drain. Those areas should be retired. In 2010, at the end of a three-year drought, when South Valley farmers were talking about stumping trees because they weren't getting enough water from the Delta, California had a record almond crop. California supplies 80% of the world's almonds. A lot of those go to China and India. The issue is whether we can continue to grow uh, subsidized crops in the desert, uh, and whether we're going to grow cotton and, and uh, uh, almonds for export, uh, and, and at, at the expense of this marvelous estuary, and um, then the expense of delta farming, the half million acres of, of, of delta farmers uh, who are fighting the intrusion of salt. Large amounts of California's land and developed water are devoted to agriculture. But there's more money to be made in construction and real estate. People with rights to water have figured that out. In the mid-1990s, billionaire landowner Stuart Resnick and other water users in Kern County negotiated with the state for control of the Kern Water Bank, the largest underground water storage facility in the nation. The Kern Water Bank 
was developed with $74 million from the Department of Water Resources and $23 million in taxpayer-approved bonds. But within a few years, Resnick and his associates were selling the water back to the state at a profit. Some of the banked water will be used for the luxury Tahone Mountain Village Resort. In 2009, a West Side landowner made a deal to sell 14,000 acre feet of water per year to the Mojave Water Agency in San Bernardino County for $5,500 an acre foot. This is a landowner who had already made a fortune turning Silicon Valley orchards into housing tracks. Also in 2009, a Bakersfield farming operation sold rights for 70 years for a planned development 230 miles north in the San Francisco Bay Area. And whatever makes money, you know, we have a hard time living without. No matter what they destroy, no matter how much they destroy for future generations, and no matter which species are wiped out, they have a right to make money. It's more valuable than gold, it's more valuable than oil, and the billionaire guy is the only one that understands that. And he wants to make sure that you don't ever realize what he's actually up to. California has some of the finest agricultural land in the world, and the people of this state have a right to expect that land to contribute to their food security. Californians ought to know up front if they are trading the future of fisheries and human-scale agriculture in the Delta and Northern California for urban development in thirsty parts of the state. Now, one of the concerns is that in the Delta, we have a very fragile levee system, and either a big earthquake or a 100-year storm could trigger a domino effect collapse of that levee system and could tie up uh, water in the Delta and, and cause a big uh, disaster. What they're really saying is the Bay Delta estuary is unsustainable, and they want to use that to justify no effort to sustain it. We can't do anything. You know, Mother Nature, levee breaks, earthquakes, sea level rise. In my view, that's all false. There is a threat of flooding all the time in the Delta, but it's one that can be managed very well with a good emergency response and some levee improvement. So really, how vulnerable is the Delta? Dr. Robert Pike is a civil engineer specializing in geotechnical, earthquake, and water resources engineering. He has almost 30 years of experience with engineering issues in the Delta. Commonly, it's said that there are 1,100 miles of uh, levees all in uh, uniformly poor condition. This is simply not true. Uh, the levee that I'm standing on, for instance, is in very good condition, and there are many miles of levees in good condition. Historically, uh, over a hundred years, there have been many levee failures. The doomsday school, who seem to have this death wish for the Delta, constantly point that out. Uh, but those uh, numbers are misleading. In the last 30 years, after the state government has put substantial money into levee improvement, along with the local reclamation districts, there's basically been one failure in 30 years. But aren't earthquakes a serious threat? Many of the doomsday stories that have come out about the Delta uh, failing as a result of levee failures in an earthquake uh, base it on the threat from the Hayward Fault, which is 45 kilometers away from where we're standing. 45 kilometers is such a distance that uh, a levee like the one I'm standing on would not be expected to suffer any damage. Based on my experience, I judge that risk to be relatively low. It is just as low, maybe even lower, than the risk to the rest of the water conveyance system that involves canals that run down the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. Hundreds of miles of delta levees are maintained by reclamation districts supported by local landowners. Chris Nudek is a civil engineer with many years of experience working on levees for delta reclamation districts. He's not too concerned about the effect of sea level rise. 
we're actually in a wonderful position. We can raise our levies, inch, two, three, four inches a year. That's relatively simple. It's a sea level is not going to occur all in one year, and raising levies over a long, perceptible time is simple. A lot of infrastructure goes across this delta that relies upon the existing protection devices of our levees. So it's. It's not just, oh, we fixed it for the state water project, or oh, we fixed it for East Bay Mud, or oh, we fixed it for this. And there's a, lot, a tremendous number of beneficiaries that rely upon those levies remaining in place. It's uh, the revenues from the farming that are being used to maintain the levy system, which protects everybody, including the, the transfer of water uh, through the Delta uh, by both the federal and the state government through their big water projects. The Economic Sustainability Plan has estimated the cost to upgrade Delta levees to the standard necessary to protect water transfers, infrastructure, and Delta communities in agriculture. It can be done for one to two billion dollars. That's much less than the 12 billion dollars that a tunnel under the Delta is currently estimated to cost. It's possible that a very robust levee system uh, could be put in place for no more than one billion dollars. Uh, two billion dollars at the outside. That is a small amount of money compared to the value of the Delta. The value of the Delta for agriculture, the value of the Delta as a historic place, the value of the Delta for recreation and tourism, the value of the Delta uh, as the home for infrastructure that has a total value in the order of $20 billion. To reduce risks over the next 100 years, we need to spend more money to protect the current investment in the Delta. We don't have our side of the story out there. We don't. If you want to scare Californians into paying for a peripheral canal or tunnel in the Delta, suggest to them that their drinking water depends on it. Over and over, we hear and read that two-thirds of Californians or 25 million people get their water from the Delta. But it isn't clear what this actually means. Few people in the state depend entirely on the Delta for the water supply. Much of the Delta water that people do get ends up flushing toilets or watering lawns. Because we treat most of our water to drinking water standards, even water we don't intend to drink. It's certainly true to say that water from the Delta helps to support a particular way of life for millions of Californians. But more and more, we are coming to recognize that way of life has costs. A variety of organizations, especially in Southern California, have begun to find ways to reduce their dependence on imported water. Among them are the tree people. We think that we can alleviate the pressure on the Sacramento River Delta, the Owens Valley, and other areas we import water on by doing the kinds of things we're doing in this park. In other words, we don't think the peripheral canal has to be built if people were to take the right steps here. For example, when we get an inch of rain on this hilltop, that gives us six inches in our cistern, which equals about 13,500 gallons. One inch of rain on this hilltop captures 13,500 gallons. Uh, the cistern total is 216,000 gallons, the size of, you know, a few swimming pools at least. Then put into motion the kinds of things we're talking about, about capturing rain in your yards, in cisterns to use for irrigation, would bring the demand for that imported water way down. California still uses more water per gallon per day than any place in the world. The state average is almost 200. We have agencies in San Diego that want desal water They're using over 300 gallons per day per person. Israel, Australia, Spain use between 30 and 40 gallons per day per person. Studies have shown that if everyone in the state used low flow shower heads and low flush toilets, urban water use could be reduced by 25 to 30%. Lawns and thirsty landscaping account for 50% or more of the average household's water use. So there's lots of room for water savings and landscaping that is better suited to California's Mediterranean climate. Uh, we've been very lucky in the past um, two generations. We haven't had an extraordinary drought. Uh, we've had very little personal sacrifice required of us. Uh, it seems to me that increased conservation increased conservation, recycling, cleaning up the dirty groundwater we have, all of those are cheaper 
and more effective ways of preserving and protecting our water supply and making better use of it. This report just came out yesterday. It's 138 pages on economic development that can be done through what we call water efficiency, which is, isn't just the traditional conservation and PR, but is really doing serious levels of demand side programs, stormwater, gray water, cisterns like you've been looking at, at tree people and there are others around the, the state. But in LA region, we're leading the way. We're starting to manufacture cisterns here you can, so you can buy large scale ones and not get them from Australia. And we're starting, we're looking at manufacturing waterless urinals so that we can do half a million rather than a desal product. I do not believe that the people of California, whether they're from Southern California or whether they're from Northern California, are gonna make the Delta a national sacrifice area. And I do not believe that the basic fundamental environmental laws of this nation that have now been tested for over 40 years are gonna let that happen. That's why we're putting together coalitions in the Congress. We're putting coalitions of citizens and business organizations as Restore the Delta is doing because we have to, we have to succeed at it. And this has to, has to be retained as a place and a, and a highly valued ecosystem and water supply system. And we all recognize that uh, we're gonna survive together or we're going to perish together. I mean, our fates are intertwined and we can't, we can't ignore that and that's why uh, in the efforts to protect this estuary, uh, there's been the oddest coalition of, of, of farmers and environmentalists and fishermen and, and small businessmen and, and, and industrial tycoons, I mean, you know, coming together to fight for this estuary because it's worth fighting for. It's a special place. It's a place called home. I mean, it is our home. History tells us that California experiences drought about a third of the time. Climate fluctuations may cause a rise in sea level, and the whole state is subject to earthquakes and the disruptions they cause. Common sense should tell us that the less we rely on water brought to us over long distances, the more secure we will be. We can improve our water security by managing water more efficiently, with less use of energy, less reliance on costly large-scale infrastructure, and less public debt. The alternatives may not create profits for those who want to use water to make money, but they will allow the people of California to take back control of the most precious resource, water. Lost on a levee road with nowhere to go, but the Delta still flows, and this is our home. Don't divide the river, don't split the farm from flow. Fish will return in time, Lord help us heal our home. With the flick of a tail, the water was gone. The dirt was dry in my hand. What my family built was taken by the few who wanted us to leave. Well, salmon never turned back. Pears fell from trees and cranes fed on grain no more. Ducks never flew by, but that water pipe was full. Awake from that dream, I will never leave. Hell with the water thieves, just let them try to take my home. Just let them try to take my home.